I have a very difficult subject, but but understand this, I am not fearful, nor am I going to be hesitant in bringing this difficult subject. I think it's a subject that needs to be brought, needs to be talked about. It's the elephant in the room uh, when it comes to society today. I'm going to say some things that most people don't want to say, uh, but I think it's important that we say them. Uh, I'm going to start with a clip, and the title of the clip is, It Makes Sense When God is Absent. Because, see, when God is ever present in your life, you just constantly feel like, I don't need anything because God is there. But the the moment God starts to separate himself from us because he's holy and we're not, we understand that the world changes when God's hand is not on something. When God starts to withdraw, you, you think it's bad now, wait till the Holy Spirit is going to be taken out of the way after the church is raptured out. It's the Holy Spirit that is constraining the evil that's going on right now. And the church. I mean, that's scriptural. You can look in the book of uh, uh, First and Second Thessalonians. The Holy Spirit and the church constrain the evil and hold Satan back. Satan runs at the Word of God. So as long as the Word of God is preached, he doesn't have total liberty. But when the Holy Spirit comes out of the way, is taken out, there's literally going to be hell on earth. You think it's bad now, it's going to get really bad. And when God starts to remove His hand... Even in the time of grace, and we're living in the age of grace, the age of grace will happen until the church is taken out in Revelation chapter 4, verse number 1. It's going to be taken out. And we find John, as he sees that picture, the church will be raptured out, and then the church will be in heaven, and there'll be a whole new dynamic that'll happen. So we're living in the age of grace until the church is taken out of the way. It's grace. But even in grace, you will see God, it, it, because of His holiness and because of His righteousness, start to withdraw in certain ways as man starts to slip. And in the last days, in the great falling away that the Bible talks about prophetically, you're going to see God's hand start to be lifted in certain areas of the kingdom work. And especially when it comes to those who reject Him. And we know God is a loving God, and we know God is a gracious and good God, but because God is holy and righteous, there comes a time when God will sometimes remove His hand and His grace from someone because they have rejected Him and rejected Him and rejected Him and rejected Him just like Pharaoh did with their hard hearts and with the vain imaginations that they have and that they deny that there's a God, God will remove His hand from that particular person or culture, and you will not see God move anymore in the lives of those individuals. It's a difficult subject. It's a hard subject to preach about a loving God. But let me tell you this. God doesn't do anything to anyone unless they deserve what they get. What He does, He will do in righteousness and in His justice. And people will have ample opportunity to make the right decision and to turn it around. So I want you to pray for me, but I said that to set up the clip, that it makes sense when God is absent, because when God is absent, we can really get a view of what needs to be done and what needs to be corrected and how culture has gotten away from God. So I want you to watch the clip, and then I'm going to come come out of Romans chapter number 1. Romans chapter number 1. It deals with judgment, it deals with wrath, but it deals with grace and mercy and righteousness. We see God wrapped up, but it more than anything else, it deals with a culture in which we're confronted with today. And I want to help you understand a mixed up generation. We've all made the statement, I think they're out of their mind. Haven't we said that? And you know what? You just spoke a truth. Watch the clip and I'll be right back. Absence is the only response that makes sense if we take into account God's holiness and justice along with the astounding amount of our sinfulness. Absence is the only response that makes sense. And this absence could have happened through one of two actions with the same consequence. God, in His holiness, could have abandoned us, or in His justice, could have destroyed us. And either would have ended our existence. That 
would have made sense. That would have been more obvious. If God, being the very definition of goodness, the very creator of writing injustices, had removed himself from the world or simply done away with it. But God's presence with creation was not finished. Yes, God did withdraw, but he offered a promise. He gave us a hope without refusing to punish. He told us he would return, but did not refuse to leave us. God removed us from himself, but still pointed to Jesus. You see, he wrote the conclusion in the preface. He put the climax in the leaflet. God put the end of Revelation at the very beginning of Genesis. Because though the serpent led Adam and Eve to make themselves dead, the same God who removed them from the garden would return to crush that demon's head. That is the part that doesn't make sense. He who had every right to be absent would make himself present. He who had every Every justification to remove his glory from our midst would remove himself from his glory to take on our sins. He who created man, who then created absence, became like one of them to remove that distance. Absence may be the only response that makes sense, but presence is the only conclusion that can exist once we understand that the God who isn't there is the God who came near in the person and the love of Jesus. It is God's will for people to believe, but it is obvious not everyone is going to believe. It is God's will that the Holy Spirit will continue to move in hearts of people till God says it's over, it's time, the last person's name has been written in the Lamb's Book of Life. And when that happens, the church will be taken away and His grace will no longer be seen as we know it because the Holy Spirit, which is the constrainer, the, re the, the revealer to us of God's purpose and will, will be taken out of the way. The revival that will happen when the church is gone will be uh, a much different mindset than what we have now. Also, if you have an opportunity to be saved during the age of grace, that is the time before the church is taken out, you need to be saved because after the church is taken out and you've heard the gospel and you've never accepted Christ as your Savior, I'm just going to tell you plain and simply, I'm just going to be cutting to the chase. I'm not going to try to muff it over and make it sound pretty. If you're not saved when the church is taken out, you will never be saved. You will never find heaven as your home. You will not. You will have had, had, had ample opportunity. And if you go to hell, it's because you chose to go there and you rejected God. Scripture's going to reveal it. I told you this is not easy. You need to find some place in this message to say amen. And I want to put a precursor. If you, as I'm teaching this, and you say, well, wait a minute. They have a right. They have a freedom. They have this. I, I want you to understand, everybody has a will. But wills are not free. Our wills are always influenced by something. And thus we make a decision because of the influence on our wills. You just don't wake up one day and decide to do something. Something behind the scenes has forced or the impressions upon that will for you to make a decision. You're a free moral agent, but your will is always influenced by something. And there will be many people in churches today that say, I don't necessarily agree with that. Let me just say this. If your mind is on the culture that is rejecting God, and you say, well, I'm not rejecting God, but I don't want to be so hard on them, you're as guilty as they are. Because the issue is they're going to deny that God has the right to do what He does. And they're going to have the right that they think that they are smarter than God and they can make their own decisions. Is that thunder? No, okay, I just, that scared me there, like a Lord saying, come on, boy, bring it, amen. <laughs> I, was, I, I wasn't sure. I want to start with verse number 16 of Romans 1. And I'm going to give you seven things, and I'm going to move as quickly as I can, and if for some reason the Holy Spirit makes us part for a while, you'll get part two next week, okay? I'll make that pledge to you. But I want to be sure that I have ample time to say what needs to be said. Paul says this in verse number 16 of Romans 1. 
He says, For I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it's the power of God unto salvation for everyone who believes. See, if you don't believe, there is no salvation. You have to believe that God is. And again, he gave the precursor as he writes the letter to his countrymen in Rome. He's, he's, he, he, he's wanting to go. He's wanting to be a part of that. But he's trying to answer some deep questions. He says, he said, the, I'm not ashamed of the gospel. And I find today many people are ashamed of the gospel. They don't want me to preach hard or they say we preach too hard. If you're saying I preach too hard, that just means you're ashamed of the gospel. I think you preach the gospel as hard as you can. I believe you tell everybody what they need to hear. I don't mind telling people that they're lost and without Jesus. Amen? I don't mind telling people you need to be saved. Because that's what this... this and he says, I'm not ashamed of the gospel. The gospel's the good news. The gospel's not the bad news. Why should I be ashamed of the good news? I, I'm not ashamed of the good news, for it's the power of God unto salvation. It's prophecy fulfilled when Jesus was born. And the angel said, Behold, I, for behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy. For unto you is born this day in the city of David, Christ the Lord will be a Savior to all people. And the heavenly host starts singing a multitude, Glory to God in the highest, and peace on earth and goodwill toward men. God is wanting men to be saved, and He sent Jesus to save us. There is no other way. There is no other way. You're not going to think your way into heaven. You're not going to be on a culture ride into heaven. You're not going to go to heaven because everybody else does, and you're not going to go to heaven because you're good, because no one is good. There is none righteous, no, not one, and we're all sinners, and we all need to be saved. And I'm going to define what saved means. Paul says this, For I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it's the power of God unto salvation for everyone who believes, for the Jew first and also the Greek. Verse 17, For in it... The it, the righteousness of God is revealed. In salvation, the righteousness of God is revealed. From faith to faith that is written, the just shall live by faith. Verse 18, he doesn't pull any punches. He doesn't wait very long. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all, everybody say all, ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth in righteousness. In other words, you start talking about salvation, you start talking about God and His goodness, and there'll be men, and the wrath of God is going to be poured out on them. Now, I didn't say that. God said it. It's going to be poured out on those who suppress the truth in, uh, in righteousness. In other words, we preach that you need to be saved. They want to suppress it. They'll say, I don't need to be saved. I'm good enough. And he said, the wrath will be poured out on those who suppress the knowledge of the truth about righteousness and uh, in, uh, in unrighteousness. Because what may be known of God is manifest in them, for God has shown it to them. Verse 20, for since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes are created are clearly seeing, being understood by the things that are made, even his, his, his eternal power and Godhead so that they are without excuse. Now let me just frame this. When God reveals himself to us and we recognize that there's a God, we are without excuse now. The mandate is do you suppress the truth or do you receive the truth? Do you believe the lie or do you continue to say, I'm going to trust God? Do you say that I'm, I'm bigger than God and I don't need to be saved? Because here's the number one thing with people coming to salvation. It's not rational. Because when you understand and see what Jesus did, God taking on the form of flesh, we beheld His glory full of grace and truth. We saw all those things, that He died for us, He took our place, and men will still say, I don't need to be saved. They don't understand what they're talking about. They're not rational in their mind. They suppress the knowledge of the truth. And if you suppress the knowledge of the truth and you're not about truth, then the wrath of God is going to fall on those who suppress it. It doesn't sound pretty. It doesn't sound interesting. It doesn't sound like a loving God. But again, what He does, He does in righteousness and holiness and goodness. If you go to hell, God didn't send you there. You go to hell because you have suppressed the knowledge of the truth of righteousness. Now, Here's the first thing I want you to write down. The declaration from God. We just read the declaration from God. And Paul said, I'm not ashamed of it. It's the gospel. It's the good news. Salvation. See, God declares that anyone can have salvation. Anyone who believes can have salvation. You might be the worst sinner in here today, and the only thing that disqualifies you from being saved is your unbelief. It's not a lifestyle. It's not what you did in the past. Your sin does not disqualify you because everyone's disqualified. We're all condemned. 
And the ones that end up with their condemnation taking away is those that believe that God is a righteous, good God and that God is the creator and we are the created. And we're going to see His wrath poured out not on individuals, but on decisions. When you make the decision not to follow God and receive Jesus Christ, the wrath of God is going to fall on your life. And it's a terrible thing. That's why the Scripture says it is a fearful thing to fall in the hands of the living God. So the declaration that God makes, salvation is available for everyone who believes in God is a holy, just, loving, kind, righteous, eternal, the creator of all things. And salvation is for everyone who believes. But let me tell you, if you don't believe, you're going to see the side of God that nobody wants to teach. See, God is so holy, He cannot look upon sin. The only way you and I can have access to God is through God's righteousness and His goodness because He's so holy, He can't look upon us. That's why Jesus cries on the cross, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? He's quoting Old Testament prophecy where God literally turns His back on sin because God is so holy. When Moses said, Let me see your glory... God says, it's too powerful for you. I'm too strong for that, but I'll let you see my backside, but I'm going to hide you in the rock, the cleft of the rock, the dugout portion, and I'm going to cover you because I'm so holy. You're still sinful, Moses, until that day of glorification. You cannot look upon me. When John the Revelator got a glimpse of God in his glory, he fell as a dead man at his feet. God is so holy, you and I cannot cannot have access to God unless God covers our sin and takes it away. And the wrath of God is that your sin is still out there. And your decision is going to annihilate you. Your decision is going to separate you from a holy God. And you think separation from God is bad on this earth, you wait till you end up in hell. I know not people are not going to like it, but the declaration is anyone can be saved. It's a conditional promise. It's on those who believe. This means not everyone will believe. For those who believe, that means there'll be some who don't believe. There's some in this audience today that don't believe and won't believe. And you won't ever believe. And you come for moral reckoning and moral understanding. But the issue is you better search your heart today and say, I believe in the Lord Jesus Christ that God sent him to take away my sin debt. And I want to trust that. And the only way I can get to heaven is not because I'm good, but because God is gracious and merciful. And he he gives me an opportunity to get rid of my sin, to cover my sin. See, the word salvation means deliverance or rescue. When you ask a person, are you saved, that means, have you been delivered? Have you been rescued? What are we rescued from? Our lostness. Do you understand what it's like to live in a world without God guiding you, without God's providential hand on you? I know it rains on the just and the unjust. That's the providential grace of God. But let me tell you, there's nothing like the personal grace of God. Because the providential grace of God will allow people to find no hope, no joy, that will panic. They have no hope for the eternity that's going to face everyone because we're created in the image of God, an eternal being, and we're going to have to face the fact that we're either going to live with God or we're going to live without God. If you live with God for all eternity, you'll be in heaven. If you live without God, you're going to be in hell. Just the way it is, and I knew it would be quiet, but I, I can't prepare to do my own amen. See... The word salvation means deliverance or rescue. We are rescued from our lostness, separated from God, but we are also or rescued or delivered from God's wrath. The same way that God is gracious, holy, and all-powerful, you cannot imagine His wrath. It's not meaning that He's just going to annihilate you. Separation from Him alone is enough. You understand what hell's going to be like? Darkness, no light. No cool breeze, eternal flame, punishment, no laughter, no cool water. Anything that you can think of, of anything that's evil separated from God, it's God that allows the evil and the light to come in your life. Everything that is good is of God, and everything that's not good is from Satan. I want you to just bear with me now, because we are delivered or rescued from God's wrath. It's real, folks. And we're living in an age where a church don't even want to preach the wrath of God. All we want to say is, God is love, God is love. And look, I'm, I'm a grace man. I, I preach grace 80% of the time. But I am also smart enough and logical enough to understand that grace is not grace without wrath. 
There has to be something to be saved from for grace to be so precious. You understand it? Why we call it amazing, because we all are sinners and we deserve to go to hell, but God in His grace reaches down and pulls us from the pits of hell. That's why we call this the pulpit. We're trying to pull people out of the pit, amen, because of God's grace. And our message should be love and kindness, but we should never neglect that God is holy and wrath will fall on those who do not believe. The goodness and righteousness of God is revealed. The it, salvation, that's what he says. Paul says, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation. It, the gospel, it is what leads us to salvation for everyone who believes. And everyone, verse 20 says, is without excuse, which we read. Oh, goodness, I wish I could have courage enough to say it sometimes. There, there are too many people who profess to be Christians that are really not Christians. That's hard to say because it makes me appear to be judgmental. But there's no way that you can encounter Jesus and fall in love with Jesus and love Him the way you're supposed to and not want to worship Him. It's impossible. The mind is not rational enough for that. You say, well, they just get saved, uh, they just get saved uh, as an escape from hell. You're not, you're not saved to escape hell. You're saved because God delivers you from your sin and from His wrath. You're not saved from a condition. You're a sinner by nature. That's not a condition. That is who man is. Man is a depraved individual, and it takes God to regenerate that individual by His grace. And we understand many people profess to be Christians, but why is God's house empty? Why is God's house, we have to struggle to get people to come? And why is God's house, when we get people in it, they don't really want to serve God, they want to attend and they want to be entertained, and we come for all the programs, but yet at the end of the day, you only have 20% of the people doing anything for God. Now, I told you it's hard. <coughs> and I don't believe everybody in here is lost, don't get me wrong, but I don't believe everybody's saved either. Just don't. I just don't. And we talk about salvation, talking about righteousness. It's better translated righteousness from God. The Greek word, I love this. When I was in school, Dr. Jim Gibson, uh, uh, he was pastor at First Baptist Church in Indiana, and he was one of my professors as I was doing online study, understanding the doctrine of God. And he introduced me to this word, this Greek word, uh, dikaosune, which interprets the righteousness of God. And it only comes, and God's the only one that's righteous because the Scripture says that none of us are good. None of us are righteous. We don't have any. God has to give it to us. He imputes it to us. He's dikaios, the Greek meaning the possessor of righteousness. And when He gives us His righteousness, He imputes it to us. That means He's going to give it to us by His grace. And righteousness means that He makes us accountable where we can come to a righteous, holy God now. We're no longer sinful. It's called dikaiosune, imputed by God. Through Jesus Christ. See, when Jesus lived a sinless, perfect life, God gives you that. He who became sin for us, who what? Knew no sin. And he became sin for us so that all the sinners could approach a holy God. But God is still holy. So we get this word, dikaosune, and we get the goodness of God. It's revealed through the person and action of Jesus Christ. God loves you that much. See, Jesus reflects... The Father's image in Himself, and He's full of grace and truth. And the word or phrase for righteousness is used over 30 times in the book of Romans. Over 30 times, talking about how the none is good, no, not one, we're not good. And I want to drive that point home today. We're living in a culture where nobody wants to say that anymore. The culture wants to say that everybody's good, and everybody has an opinion, even if it's contradictive to what God says. That's what they want. And they, they don't want us to say anything about it. They don't want us to give any truth because, see, they want to suppress the truth. They want to say that I'm good. And they'll look at us and say, how dare you tell me I'm not good. I'm as good as you are. We're not declaring that by ourselves. We're declaring that because what the Bible says. The only thing that makes you and me good is what Jesus did for us on Calvary and by God's grace. And we understand because, see, the wrath of God is going to fall on people who suppress the knowledge of the truth. <coughs> it's important that you understand it. So here we are, the declaration of God. Anybody in here today wants to be saved, you can be saved. 
If you say, I want to be saved, your sin does not obliterate you. Your sin does not get in your way from coming to God. I don't care if you smoke, drink drugs, steal, lie, cheat, do adultery, whatever. That does not stop you from coming to Christ and accepting Christ. The only thing that will send you to hell is blaspheme against the Holy Spirit because all manner of sin will be forgiven except that. Blaspheming against the Holy Spirit when the Holy Spirit says that you must believe in Jesus Christ to be saved and you say, I don't have to do that, then guess what? That sin will be unforgiven. But every sin you've ever committed, the minute you come to Christ, your sin is covered. And God declares that anyone can be saved. And if you want to be saved today, you haven't gone too far. But if you realize that you're a sinner and you say, I don't want to be saved. I like what I'm doing. I don't care what you say, preacher. You might experience the wrath of God before your life is over. You might go a step too far. You might send away your day of grace with your rejection. Why do you think the Bible says today is the day of salvation, now is the appointed time? Let me give you the second thing. This is super important. The delusion of men. The delusion of men. Because they suppress the truth of God in unrighteousness. They manufacture a delusional story. Understand that. John 1, 9 says that Jesus is the light that gives light in the hearts of every man. I mean, I can't contradict what the Bible says. Jesus is the light, and God is the light that gives light to the hearts of every man. But men love darkness rather than light. They like living in that dark condition, that evil, dark condition. When the light comes on and it starts to reveal them, they create a delusional story. Okay, and again, I'm trying to logically help you understand just a little bit about this delusional story. This is what they have the delusion, that there is no wrath of God. Churches have to be careful that we're not accomplices in not teaching the whole counsel of God. We have to teach about the wrath of God as a warning to people that if you're not careful, God's hand's going to come off your life. And you might face the judgment of God because of your unbelief. That's why and we find people crying out through Scripture, God, I believe, but help my unbelief. If you're a marginal believer now, I'd be praying that my belief would be strong in Him. The manufacture of a delusional story. The types of delusions include, I want you to understand this now, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to help you a little bit. Not only do I have two doctorates, and I'm not bragging, I'm not being pretentious, I, I'm, a, I'm a licensed Certified Christian counselor or biblical counselor and I can only counsel with that certificate that I have in biblical issues and we have to understand that in the ministry you have to help people with certain types of issues that come up that scripture gives obvious answers to these problems I, I, I don't diagnose medical issues I diagnose spiritual issues I diagnose things that make you think wrong. I diagnose what sin does. I diagnose all those things through scriptural training. But in delusion, we find there are types of delusions, and they include persecutory, okay? Just like a prosecutor, prosecutorial uh, judgment will fall. But some people have this idea that they're going to persecute people with their delusion or that they're being persecuted. It's delusional. Then there's grandiose delusion. There's erotomaniac delusion. That they have this delusion about sin with sex and all of these things. Now, all of these things are going on in our culture, okay? I'm going to explain these. There's jealous delusion. There's mixed delusion. Mixed delusion just absolutely says anything they say that they act crazy. They're delusional. Does that not describe a culture a little bit? Let me, let me help you with a little bit. The persecutory uh, delusion is the idea that they are being persecuted unjustly and someone imposing on their freedom. They think because we preach the gospel, we're imposing on their freedom. We think, or they think, politically because conservatives, now this is not a political stand, but most conservatives have a biblical worldview. 
We believe in the sanctity of life. We believe God is alive and well and on the throne. We believe that man's a sinner and that man needs to be saved. Amen. We believe we ought to treat everyone equal. We ought to love our enemies. We ought to love our brother. We believe that race is not an issue. We believe that we're to help the poor. We're to help the needy, visit the sick, visit those in prison. We just believe that we want to live peaceable, good lives with God as our king. Not the government as our king, not a political party as our king, not any of that. That's what a biblical worldview is. That, and, 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 and see, when you start to say that I differ from the culture's view, then they get delusional <clears throat> and they think you're persecuting them. But again, they're delusional. They have lost their mind. Grandiose delusion is that one has unfounded or inaccurate beliefs that one has special identity or power. They think because that they have this grandiose idea that they're better than you they're better than you now if you look at the culture today they're looking down their nose at believers and at churchgoers they're even getting it so bad that some churches are called terrorists and they want to stamp us out and they want to why do you think it's called council culture they want to cancel us out. There are certain shows that if you say anything, that's why woke comes on. If you don't do it their way because it's grandiose for them, if you don't believe they the way they believe, they want to punish you with their delusional ideas. That's why we say they're out of their mind. And we might put an adjective in front of the word mind. Can I get an Amen. They're out of their mind because they're delusional. Now, hang on with me. It's important. See, that grandiose idea, the uh, erotomanic, maniac uh, delusion, is that no uncommon, it, it's, it's an uncommon disorder in which an individual has an unfounded belief that others are in love with them and that everybody loves them. That's why marriage is no longer a holy union. Because in that kind of delusional state of mind, you believe that anybody will love you and that love is not really the way the Bible talks about. Love is finding pleasure in today and they're trying to find it in any kind of sexual act that's going on with anybody and anything goes. And if you have a different view, they're delusional because your view is different from their view. In that delusion of that, that's why they do not want to identify. Let me tell you, women, if, it's, it's okay for us men to be, I almost said it, but be upset. But if I were a woman, and I'm not, and I never will be. And no matter what doctor I go to, I'll never be anything more than God created in me. I'm going to be a man. I might be a fallen man, but I'll never be a woman. I'll never give birth Amen? I'll, I'll never be able to do what a woman does. And I don't want to do what a woman does. I do not. I, I, but if I were a woman, I'd be the maddest individual on the planet because they're trying to take you women totally out of the picture. They're trying to defame you. We can't use the pronouns now of male, female, uh, husband, or wife. Are you kidding me? They want to counsel everything? They're delusional. And it comes through that erotomaniac idea. Then there's that, that jealousy that comes in, the jealous delusion. It's always in, they're always insecure of anyone who gets more attention than they do. So it's important that you understand, whatever the imaginations or wherever the imaginations will take them, it's from the influence of delusion. They're delusional. That's why they have lost their mind. Let me read it again. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth and unrighteousness because what may be made known of God is manifest in them for God has shown it to them for since the creation of the world his invisible attributes being clearly seen understood, understood by the things that are made even his eternal power and Godhead so that they are without excuse because although they knew God they did not glorify him as God nor were they thankful but became futile futile in their thoughts and their foolish hearts were darkened mm. see facts and history don't matter to the illusion of men 
Facts and history don't matter when you're trying to take people from a place that was once bad, but history has brought us to a place that's better. Nobody wants to hear that. They make up crap. I don't know if you can say that, but they make it up. They make it up. Facts don't matter. It's not part of the landscape. They're delusional. They believe what the delusion impresses on their mind. They also believe that they are always right and everyone else is wrong, and they just don't think clearly. Anytime you suppress the truth about God on any subject, you will not think right or clearly. Understand where I'm at. Number three, write this down. The demagogue affirmation. The demagogue affirmation. When I say demagogue, it means they made themselves or someone else God. This culture is full of gods of people who think they know more than God. And again, the wrath of God is people who suppress the truth about a righteous God and about a loving God and about the gospel. Paul said, I'm not ashamed of it. And people are suppressing it. And by the way, it's not new. Rome was the greatest culture of its day, but Rome was destroyed from the inside because of culture and because of their rejection of God. It had an opportunity. But Rome is going to fall. And you know what happens after Rome falls? Rome becomes the center and the epic center of Christianity 100 years after the time of Jesus from a place that fell with their demagoguery attitude and their delusional mind becomes the epic center of the Christian faith. You think God's not going to be glorified? God's wrath took Rome out, but God's glory built up the Christian faith that came from Rome, spread to the, to the east, Constantinople and Turkey, so much so that they wanted to have two divisions of the churches and what's called the Great Schism. Now, I could give you a lot of church history but that's what happened God's wrath came in and Rome fell apart from the inside you know what's going on in America we're falling apart from the inside demagoguery affirmation it starts with the impression the suppression of truth about unrighteousness and if you speak out against sin churches will will dismiss pastors the average pastor in America I'm gonna shock you you know what his tenure is 18 months 18 months if he preaches against sin. If for 18 months, that's all he's going to last. They're going to fire him. Fire me if you want. I'll have no trouble getting a job next week. There will be a group of believers that will want somebody that will teach truth because God's truth always prevails. You need to understand it. And if you've got somebody... If you've got somebody who loves you enough to share the truth with you, you better hang on to them. Because, see, the wrath of God comes against truth suppression. And truth suppression comes when, I believe it starts from the top. If the top teaches truth enough, and I'm going to talk about truth, if it teaches truth enough, then your people will start believing in truth. If a lie comes, they'll know how to identify it. They'll say, uh-uh, that ain't going to happen here. Sorry, Jack, that ain't going to work. The demagogue affirmation, their defense is bundled in a lost sense of reason. I want you to take your Bibles, and please, take your Bibles. Turn to 2 Timothy. This is ch chapter 3. 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 1 through 9. Demagoguery affirmation. See, individuals become their own God. Let, and I'm going to say this, I know this is going to be real controversial. I believe our country is totally misguided. Totally misguided. Donald Trump is not the answer to America's problems. Demagoguery affirmation is not good in him, nor is Joe Biden the answer to our country's problems. Politics is not. They've set themselves up to be demagogues. They want to think that they know more about you. They want to say that your kids are not your kids anymore. They're our kids. They've made themselves gods over us. And if we don't agree with them, they want to bring the wrath of the government and the justice system against us. I'm telling you the truth. And the politics, they're weaponizing even our judicial system. The judicial system was set up with the, 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 the branch of government that was supposed to keep 
the legislative branch and the executive branch was supposed to be kept in check by the nonpartisan judicial system. So if anybody in the executive branch or the legislative branch got out of line, the judicial system would hold them accountable, remove them from office because it's supposed to be the government for the people and by the people. But because of the demagogue affirmation, now they think that they control us. And in reality, we ought to fire every one of those bums and get them out and start all over again and would have a country that mattered again. See, demagoguery affirmation, this is where it comes from. No, but know this. Isn't that something? Scripture says, but know this. That in the last days, perilous times will come. Well, my gosh. Look at that. I can't believe that's right there in the Bible. Perilous times will come, for men will be lovers of themselves. Lovers of money, boasters, proud, blasphemers. You know what blasphemers is? That's, that's talking negative, ugly about Almighty God, the Creator, thinking that you have the right to defame God Himself. Do you understand that? Using His name in vain. Blaspheming, saying that I, I say that there's a God, but I'm going to live without God. You blaspheme God. In other words, you've slapped God in the face, spit in His face. You, you've thrown hot water on God. You've done everything that you could. That's what a blasphemer is. It's a bad thing. That's why Jews would rent their clothes if you blasphemed against God in the Old Testament. It was an outward sin. How dare you? And they would rip their clothes. Today, we ought to be so... I almost said it again. We ought to be so upset that we just rip our clothes and say, don't you talk about God that way. Do you know why David slew Goliath? I'm going to tell you why. It wasn't because he was good with a sling. Because he got hacked off when Goliath started defaming the God of Israel, and he went back and told all the big boys, is there not a cause? And I'm fixing to go fight this blasphemer and God's going to be with me and we're going to make that giant fall. We need some Davids to rise up today and say they're blaspheming God and we're not going to stand for it. And we're going to do what we need to do. And David puts that stone in that sling and knocks old Goliath down and then he takes Goliath's own sword and cuts his head off. You say, how do you do that? I'm going to tell you the only way I know how to do it. You get everybody you can to go vote and vote with a biblical worldview and you cut that giant's head off, amen, and you get a voice. If you sit back and do nothing, you are guilty. Don't do it. Demagogy affirmation. Look what Timothy had. I didn't finish it. Look what blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, unloving, unforgiving, slanders without self-control. Does that not describe this generation? Do you understand what I'm saying? This, God, by the way, and God's not shocked by this. God's not sitting in heaven saying, Oh, Lord, what am I going to do? Holy Spirit, Son, angels, what are we going to do? Look at how they're acting down on earth. They have left everything we taught them. God said this is exactly how they're going to act. You know why? They don't acknowledge Him as God. It's a little view of what separation without God will bring into one's life. And it brings us misery. We can't live peaceably. We can't live lovingly. We can't have harmonious relationships with anyone, anytime. See, the world has been coming together for some time. I believe we crossed the racial barrier. If you mix couples in America now, it's over, over 11%. That, and you say, that's, that's a low number. No, it's not. It used to be against the law, period. And I believe we've crossed that barrier. I went to a high school football game, and I was just grinning on how that social groups just intermingled with no division of race at a high school football game. If you'll leave the kids alone, the kids are going to figure this thing out. But see, because we started having this acceptance and we started having this loving kindness attitude and this oneness of the world, the other side says, we know race will divide them, so we're going to make race an issue again, and we're going to back up on all the ground that we've gained because we're going to punish everybody because they want to do what's right in God's eyes. Now, I'm just telling you the truth. I'm just telling you the truth. I'm not smart. I'm not the smartest tool in the shed, but I do have the Bible at my hand, and I know it pretty well. Look what it says. 
He says, to be unloving, unforgiving, slanders without self-control, brutal, despisers of good, traitors, headstrong, haughty lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God, having a form of godliness but denying the power, and from such people, turn away! Goodness gracious, if you're under the influence of some of those folks, get away from them. If your Facebook friends have that view, tell them I can't do that anymore. I'm sorry. If you're going to blaspheme God every day, you cannot be my friend. If you're going to curse God and you're going to curse God's people, you cannot be my friend. Well, that's not kind. What are you talking about? I would rather honor God than honor men. If you don't stand up for something, they'll never believe in you. If you don't love God enough and say, I'm a committed Christian enough to stand for what's right, they're going to say what you believe doesn't really matter because you're not willing to love it enough to stand up for it. You know why the church grew so much? People were being persecuted. They said, it doesn't matter. I'm not going to bend. And the church grew. Demagogy affirmation is one of the things that will kill a nation. And listen to me. Individuals become their own God, or at best, many people become their God. Politicians become gods. Professors in our education system, listen to me. Your kids will listen to a teacher or professor before they'll listen to you. And they're believing the lie. I'm 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 going to encourage everyone, go join your local school board and get involved in your PTAs and what's going on in your school. You show up, things will change. You vote the right people in, and you don't have to worry about what who who rules your kid. Your kid goes to a counselor and there's got some issue and 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 listen to me, if the school I don't have kids in school. My days done come and gone. They better be glad because I'm crazy now. I wasn't quite as crazy when I was younger. But if you start messing my grandkids in school, I know I'm not their mom and their daddy. But I have influence over their mom and daddy. I'm going to get their mom and daddy. I say, come on, we're going to school board. I'm going to hold your hand. I got your back. And matter of fact, you don't want to talk. I'll talk. You just stand behind. But if they start messing with my grandkids, I promise you, I'm going up. They're going to know what I got to say. I don't have to worry about it because I know my son-in-laws will do what they need to do. And I got their back. Say, well, they might get arrested. I'll bail them out. I'll get them out. Don't worry about it. I got money to buy a lawyer. It don't matter to me. We're going to stand for what's right. You start messing with my kids. They're not the government's kids. They're not the education system's kids. And you're not going to teach them critical race theory. And you're not going to teach them transgender stuff. Because that's the lie. That is a lie that is contradicted to what God said. That is contradicted to what the world says. And if I see they want to put enough pressure, cancel culture wants to put enough pressure, well, you'll just shut up because they're suppressing the knowledge of truth and righteousness. I'm telling you guys the truth. Politicians, professors, teachers, other people who see it their way, I truly believe birds of a feather flock together. And if that bird ain't got my kind of feathers, I don't want to be in their nest. Amen. I'm having the decision to stop or go on. I think I'm going to stop. All right, it's on y'all. Uh, I I believe the wise thing to do is to say, Holy Spirit, we're going to stop. Because it's too good to rush through. The crescendo of, we just got started, folks. I'm going to bring my soapbox back next week with another step on it. Amen. I I truly believe that your mind and your heart is open now. And I truly believe that you can see what Paul says. I'm going to challenge you for this this week. As Paul says, for I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. For it's the power of God unto salvation. I want Kenny, wherever you're at or whoever, come. Because I'm going I'm to stop right now. I think I, it's, just, it's just a perfect place. Because we'll see the fruit probably next week. And next week we'll be full. Don't worry. There's plenty to say. Don't, don't worry. I want to get into this term called micro-antagonism. 
the word I've researched, micro-antagonism. Why do you think we hack them off so much? We can say one little thing and they become ballistic on us, right? But I'm going to teach you some things. But right now, this is what I want to teach you. Ryan, bring down the lights if you would. I want Kenny to come. I want to pray for every believer in here that you'd not be ashamed of the gospel of Christ. For it is the power of God unto salvation. You say, well, nobody saves anybody. We don't. You know what saves people? The gospel. The gospel, the good news. It saves people who are lost. Lost. Salvation, I told you, when you look at those terms about salvation, when you think about what, what that really means and what it's all about, it, it means that we're being delivered from something. We're being delivered from being a sinner that separates us from God. We're being delivered from the wrath of God that's going to be poured out on people who reject God. That's what you're delivered from. You're not delivered from hell. Hell is the consequence. Hell will be the dwelling place for the consequence of you going there because you have rejected God. And the gospel is the good news, and I'm not ashamed of it because I know it's the power of God for people to be saved. And I don't believe you get right with moral cleansing. I don't believe you get right by saying, I'm not going to sin anymore. If you're not saved, you're going to always be a sinner. Even if you are saved, you're just not going to be as bad a sinner. But you're going to be a sinner. I'll get saved when I got more time and I can dedicate myself more. No, you won't. If you won't get saved today, you probably will never get saved. That's why the scripture says in the book of Corinthians, now is the accepted time. Today is the day of salvation. And God says this, and I'll help you in that time. See, God does not want anybody to go to hell. And if you go to hell, you can, you can never blame a just, holy God because you went because you rejected Jesus Christ one of the greatest teachers in all America John MacArthur will say that in his study Bible in his notes anyone who goes to hell goes by their own volition because they rejected Jesus Christ and he's a reformed theologist he teaches that there's some that are ordained to heaven some ordained to hell but he'll say those that are ordained to hell will go because they rejected Jesus Christ so what are you telling me, Pastor? I'm telling you, if you don't know Jesus right now, you can know Jesus. You haven't gone too far. If you have any inclination in your soul that you want to be saved, you haven't gone too far and the wrath of God is not going to fall on you. It'll only fall on you when you reject Him. And if you're here this morning and you say, I'm not saved, and Pastor, I don't want to go to hell, and I don't want to experience the wrath of God, and I want to be delivered from this thing called sin and this condition called sin, would you pray for me? I want you to, every head bow first, and then I want, if you say, I want to be saved, I want to receive Christ, I want you to raise your hand right now, just, and hold it high where I can see it, please. I see one. God bless you, sir. God bless you. You, this young couple right here, God bless you. Thank you. There's one on the back. There's, there's another one over here. You, you can put your hands down. Uh, again, th this, this is so powerful. So powerful. Pastor Jacob, Pastor Cameron, are you, are you uh, willing or available? I need you to come. Uh, again, if you raise your hand, here's what I want you to do. Every head's bowed. No one's looking. We're not going to infringe upon your, 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 your privacy here. I want you to stand because I'm going to send someone to pray with you. This, this couple right here, God bless you. You, you stand. Pastor Cameron, you, you grab these two guys. Pastor Jacob, uh, you come. There was a, there's a couple right over here. Would you go right to them? Amen. That's four people standing. Is there someone else? Say, I'm not saved. I want to be saved today. I don't want, I don't want to reject Jesus. I want to believe in Jesus. I, I, I don't want to go to hell. I don't want the wrath of God on my life. I want to be saved today. Is there anyone else? Anybody? Any youth? Understand the wrath of God even falls on youth. Youth can say, no, God, I don't want you today. I like what I'm doing. I like living the way I live. I can reject God free moral agent you said I could reject God 
I did, but it's not a wise thing. It's not a good thing. Anybody else? Amen. There are four that are standing. Anyone else needs to be saved, I want you to stand. I'll send my sweet wife to come pray with you, talk with you. Anyone, just say, I want to receive Christ as my Savior. Anyone else? I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it's the power of God unto salvation. Amen. Mr. Jim or somebody, will you pray with that, that little, little lady right there? Amen. Let's give them a moment while they're being prayed for. Four precious people receiving Jesus Christ as their Savior. That's why I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it's the power of God unto salvation. Now let me ask this audience. Who's going to be willing to pick up the mantle with your pastor and say, I'm not going to keep silent. I'm, I, I am going because I'm not ashamed. I'm going, I'm going to not be canceled. I'm not going to let them cancel me. I want you to stand where I could pray for you for your courage and your wisdom. If you say, I'm not going to be canceled. I'm going to stand strong. I'm going to preach and teach the gospel. I'm going to share the love of God. And I'm not going to be afraid to tell someone when they're wrong. People all over this building are standing. Dawn, I heard you say something about revival. You'd love to see revival break out. Well, the, the, the candle just got lit. The wick is lit. The fuse is lit. Now let's let it, let's just let it blow up. You know the word power, and Paul says, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it's the power of God unto salvation. It comes from a Greek word. You know what the word is? Dunamis. That's where we get the word dynamite from. Dunamis, it's the power of God unto salvation. It'll blow up. You light the fuse, it'll blow up. You share Christ with somebody, and I promise you, their heart will blow up for Jesus. You light a fire under, a person gets passionate about the gospel and leading people to Christ, and they start telling their friends, it'll blow up. Lives will be changed. People you think won't get saved will get saved. Friends who live like a dog will turn around. People who live like the world will get saved, and you'll see that miraculous work of God. It's the power of God unto salvation simply because the power of God blew up in their heart, and guess what? A light in their heart is never the same again. It'll shine with the glory of God and the glory of Jesus all through their life. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Let me pray for you right now, as I said I would, for all those standing. Father, I pray for this group of warriors. I pray this, this pump is primed, Lord. I pray that when we preach your word next week, that the, not only we light the fuse, we'd be ready to, to go and throw. Father, I pray for every person standing for courage, for wisdom. I pray that they'd study the word of God. I pray that they would, they would be on their knees and God would, you'd lay somebody on their heart that they could share the gospel with. That's the real, that's the real proof of it all. Are they willing to share it? Are they willing to be a Paul? Are they willing to, to take that gospel and not be ashamed of it? And they'll see how that promise is so real. There'll be some who won't believe. We understand that. But there's going to be plenty who do believe. Because your word said the harvest is ready. I just need workers in the field. So, Father, thank you for what you've done here today. Thank you for part one of this message. Thank you for the Holy Spirit bringing such a response, an active, strong response from your people. And Father, I pray for wisdom. I pray for my health. I pray that I'd be able to preach with no obstacles. My mind would be clear. There'd be no fear. There'd be boldness. But Father, most of all, I pray that there'd be the love that you shed abroad in my hearts would be seen as we bring this message. Father, I don't want anybody to experience your wrath. I want people to turn. And Father, if they turn, we understand it has not been too late for them that your grace is strong and that your grace abounds. And where sin abounds, grace abounds the more. Father, bless this audience this week. Give them wisdom. And I pray that you'd light a seat under them that bring someone back next week as we, as we take this a step further. We pray for our church. We pray for our city. Most of all, we pray for our country and the crazy people who are running it. And we know why. Next week, we're going to know a little bit more. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Give the Lord a hand clap if you would.